Today, I will be talking about rapid DNA response on the wings of Trulial, a case that Cybergenetics was involved in that entailed solving a case in one week and appearing in court. It was a homicide in Baltimore where three young children around 10 years old were slain in an apartment. Their bodies were found in a very bloody crime scene. One of the children had been decapitated. Two of them were partially beheaded in this very violent crime scene. And the question was, who had done it? And what was the evidence that could be developed in order to find uh, their killer or killers? The task was actually to keep DNA in evidence. The defendant had been through two previous trials. The first one had ended in a hung jury, the second in a conviction, but there was an appeal that overturned those guilty verdicts. What made the the case uh, more challenging for the prosecution is that this time some of the DNA evidence that had been allowed in the second trial would not be allowed in the third trial. The Baltimore Crime Lab from the city requested help in processing this case in a fairly short time frame. The evidence was clothing from the back of a set of genes uh, from the left and right knee areas. Each of the DNA samples that had been developed was a mixture of the suspect along with his young relatives. There was an apparent inclusion that was seen in the data but no match statistic could be developed. And this is because the common probability of inclusion or CPI statistic is not appropriate uh, for these complex mixtures, particularly if they have uh, relatives that are contained in the mix. So there's a need to separate out the genotypes from these mixture samples. By separating out the genotypes, the problem is then turned back into a single source comparison of one component of the evidence to just one reference sample. And when you compare one genotype from evidence to one individual, this is a single source comparison, like a random match probability, that is much simpler mathematically, conceptually, as well as to explain. So one week before the trial, the prosecutors contacted Cybergenetics and uh, expressed an interest in having Trulial separate out the mixture into single source components and then make statistics that would be valid in court. The evidence was DNA mixtures comprised of three or four relatives. In this pedigree of the family, uh, in blue we see uh, the relatives, uh, parents, and other individuals. The victims are shown in red. There are a pair of siblings along with a cousin, and the two suspects were also family members. The one of interest in this trial, the cases had been severed, is shown on the bottom left. So he's a cousin of the victims. The timeline for this trial was rather tight. Uh, On a Tuesday, two years ago, we were contacted by the crime lab and told that there was this case. We offered to speak with the prosecutors, and then on Wednesday, the next day, we did speak with the prosecutors. They explained what the case was about and what was needed, and they began sending some data. And on Thursday, uh, most of the data arrived, and Cybergenetics began true allele processing of the two different mixture samples. On Friday, over the phone, we began preparing the prosecutors for the true allele evidence that would be presented. Interestingly, at this point, no one knew what would be happening the following week. Would it be a hearing? Would it be a trial? Would it be an admissibility hearing? It just was uncertain. So we had to prepare quite a bit over the weekend. uh, The prosecutors did their reading, uh, which we had provided them, and cybergenetic staff prepared a true allele report on the match statistics that were developed by the computer. By Monday morning, uh, the trial materials had been prepared and sent to the prosecutors, and we were in meetings reviewing these materials. On Tuesday, the discovery materials were sent 
to the prosecutors. And then at that point, midday, we found out that the judge wanted us in court the next morning, not later in the week. So some of us piled into a car and we drove down from Pittsburgh to Baltimore to be ready Wednesday morning in court for whatever would happen, whether it was a hearing or a trial, something involving the DNA evidence. The DNA data that we received were mixtures. Uh, They look in this picture like there may only be two contributors, but because they're relatives and they have tremendous overlap of genotypes and alleles, Uh, There are actually three or four individuals. Uh, DNA data from a mixture is a pattern of peak heights that occur. And the patterns are very informative. Uh, Instead of just asking whether alleles are in or out, the patterns tell us which alleles are present more than others. They indicate in the quantities that they have what the variation is as well between the different peak heights. And from this information, uh, genotypes can be derived. This is how TrueAllele separates out a DNA mixture. It begins with the data, the data that we saw on the preceding slide. And what it does is it doesn't touch the data. There's no thresholding. There's no changing of the data. That pattern with a low 16 and a high 17 and a lower 18 and a medium 19 shown as the signal in blue in the background that we just saw on the previous slide, that's unchanged. What does change is the computer tries to explain this quantitative peak height pattern by proposing many different genotypes. It proposes, uh, for example, uh, in this one snapshot, Uh, 1719, shown in blue, as one person's allele pair. In orange, there's another person's allele pair, say a 17 and an 18. In green, there's the stacking of alleles from a third homozygote individual with a 1616. Adding up all these different quantities of the allele pairs produces a pattern when the heights of those summed rectangles are close to the heights of the observed peak data, then that explanation, those genotypes, have a higher likelihood. When patterns are proposed that move those rectangles around, for example, suppose the orange rectangle on the top of the 17 was moved over to the left uh, to a 15, where there's a very low peak height. That doesn't explain the data as well, and so it's a worse explanation that confers lower probability to each of the component genotypes. By having the computer try this uh, 10,000 or 100,000 times, moving these rectangles and their heights and the allele pairs, trying out all over the place, trying out different genotypes, the computer can objectively separate a DNA mixture into, in this case, three contributor genotypes. An inferred contributor genotype is, is shown on this slide of the 100 or so possible allele pairs at this locus, the data has concentrated the probability into just a few possibilities, most of it put at the 1719 allele pair shown at the right. This separation is completely objective. It's determined only from the DNA data, and it has no knowledge of the suspect with whom the comparison will be made. So at every locus, a separated genotype looks like this picture, it's a probability distribution of different probabilities indicated on the y-axis for different allele pair possibilities indicated on the x-axis. And there'd be three different pictures like this, one for each of the genotypes at this locus, and that triple would be replicated for every locus. So that's what the inferred separated genotypes look like. To calculate a match statistic, once we have separated out genotypes is straightforward. It's just like random match probability. The question is, how much more does the suspect match the evidence than a random person? The blue bars are the same as on the last slide. That's the probability distribution of the separated genotype from the evidence. The brown bars that now appear are from a random person developed from a population database, and that can give the chance of a coincidental match. So before seeing the data, the genotype allele pair on the bottom right, 1719, uh, was indicated in brown as about 3.6%. 
But after having seen the data, indicated in blue is the evidence genotype up at 88%. That's where most of the probability has been concentrated for this contributor. That ratio of blue to brown after seeing the data to before seeing the data, or evidence to coincidence, is around 24, and that's the number of the match statistic at this locus. Now, in the issue true allele report, we're not looking at just one locus, uh, which uh, was VWA in this case, indicated on the bottom of this picture on the left. Here are all the different loci uh, and what their match statistics are. The longer the bar, the higher the likelihood ratio, or the DNA match statistic. Because these loci are independent, multiplying these numbers together gives the joint or total match statistic, and that lets us state in the report, after a lot of other background information, that a match between the inside left knee pants and the suspect is 86.6 trillion times more probable than a coincidental match to an unrelated Hispanic person. The number 86 trillion has about 13 zeros in it after the one, and uh, from the validation studies that we've done, would indicate a very, very definite match. In fact, once the match is much beyond, uh, as a statistic, 100 or 1,000, it's a very definite match. In this case, we also looked at the chance of a false positive error. And on the x-axis, we see the number of zeros in the match statistic, or the log LR. The y-axis is indicating the count or the frequency of the non-contributor log LR distribution. And on the left, that histogram is showing tremendous exclusionary power of this uh, genotype because the separated genotype has an average of around negative 20 zeros, meaning uh, 1 over 1 followed by 20 zeros. The green line in the center indicates no information. And the suspect statistic is added around 13 zeros. And you can calculate that the error the chance of a false positive here is extremely small, less than one in over one followed by a hundred zeros. With this report in place, Cybergenetics then prepared the prosecutor uh, for going to trial. We developed PowerPoint slides like the ones you've just seen. We taught them true allele concepts of genotype probability and match statistics based on comparing Uh, probability genotypes and likelihood ratios, both through discussions and through reading. We explained the case report once they had an understanding of how DNA mixture separation works. We then reviewed together the discovery packet, and we covered the many validation studies that had been done, so they had a sense of why the system was reliable. That was important for trial, but also we discussed admissibility materials in the event uh, there would be a fry hearing that uh, no one had expected. We didn't know what would be happening in court. So with all this preparation for over a few days, mainly over the weekend and the days bordering, the prosecutors were now ready for court. We drove down on the night before because we had very short notice. The hearing date had been moved back a few days. So we uh, flew in on the wings of True Allele, arriving at the hotel that had been arranged for us in the middle of the night, uh, getting ready to uh, be in court the next day. We didn't know what we would expect. Were there going to be just pretrial motions? Would there be a full-blown admissibility hearing? Was there a jury trial about to commence as scheduled? Was there going to be a continuation? It was very unclear. What happened is that there was a continuation. We were, had been ready for anything, but In the end, the defendant did plead guilty, and the cousin of these three children, who were nearly beheaded in 2004, pled guilty to second-degree murder uh, in these crimes for the uh, beheading or near-beheading of his uh, three young relatives. True allele is a very reliable science. Uh, There are dozens of validation studies that have been done by crime labs uh, independently and by us uh, collaboratively. There are, at this point, seven published peer review papers that describe uh, different axes of True Allele's reliability. 
its sensitivity, the degree to which uh, the match statistic uh, indicates a correct inclusion, its specificity, how negative log LRs indicate a correct exclusion, uh, reproducibility of when random programs are run, that the answers that are obtained are very close. True allele has also been accepted by the courts in the United States. So far, there have been six challenges in uh, six different states, Fry challenges, Dauber challenges, and in every case, uh, the courts have admitted true allele into evidence, often commenting on the reliability of the computer method, particularly when contrasted with other methods. True allele is used throughout the United States whether as laboratory systems that are purchased by crime labs or described in case reports that prosecutors, police, or defense attorneys uh, might ask for. There have been several hundred cases that cybergenetics has been involved in, and this is across half the states so far in the U.S. In the crime laboratory, there are a dozen or more crime labs that are, have purchased True Allele to use it in-house. Uh, the first group to go live was Kern County in California, Bakersfield. The second group was the Commonwealth of Virginia, where True Allele is used across the state for complex mixtures having three or more contributors. A group in South Carolina was the next lab to come on board. We're expecting that Baltimore, Maryland uh, may well be the next group in a month or so to go live with True Allele, and there are many other labs now coming online with the system. Another option that's been developed that we now have made available, if you contact Cybergenetics, we can provide you with the details, is instead of having Cybergenetics do the work, as we did in this case, or purchasing a system like uh, many crime labs do, is an intermediate option, which is to rent True Allele through the internet, uh, to use it in a cloud-based way. Uh, this lets a crime lab explore the system. They can use it as a extra capacity for training, for validation. They can use it to extend the capabilities they have, or they can uh, use it without even having True Allele in-house as a computer. They can just run the complex, important cases as needed as they arise. This lets crime labs solve important unreported cases. It makes the uh, information available through internet to prosecutors and police. It makes discovery even easier in a very transparent way to the defense to provide this information via internet. It's also good uh, in courses where we use the True Allele cloud as part of forensic education for DNA analysts. For more information about True Allele, please visit our website. There's a section on information where there's hundreds of pages web pages of courses and newsletters, a newsroom with how True Allele is used in cases. There are over 50 presentations, over 50 publications, and uh, many webinars that uh, teach how the system works in various series. The system is also available and explained on YouTube, where on the YouTube channel, we have narrated PowerPoints of talks like these that explain how True Allele can be understood and used in cases. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, uh, this would be a good time to take them. Thank you.